Tom got started in the ja in, with his interest in jazz um, by working with uh, Bob Weinstock, owner of Prestige Records in 1956, and he was hired to uh, design album covers. And from there, he just became further and further interested, and the um, pieces that are on the wall now are representative of the kind of work he was doing during the period of the 50s and 60s. And Walkin', which is Miles Davis All-Stars, if I remember correctly, it's designed by, it was using um, uh, transparent color papers, laying them on and producing different colors. <laughs> Walkin' is that, that stoplight, and he tramped all over New York trying to find an old-fashioned stoplight, and he finally found one. And then uh, Long Lake is a watercolor on paper, which he did up in Michigan, uh, where he used to go, uh, where their parents lived in the summer. And Tenor Madness, not much needs to be said about that, but it turned into an iconic. And then Lock and Horns, it was where he was playing entirely with pipes and locking the pipe together as in locking horns. And uh, he had a long career uh, doing jazz covers. He probably designed 75 of them. He was published in a book called New York Jazz. He had something like 20 covers in that uh, magazine or book. And he continued until we finally we moved up to here in Vermont in, the, in 1969. Wow, I, uh, I am the curator of, of this show here at All, All Faith Full Church and um, put it together because um, for a long time I thought it was very interesting that we have a graphic designer who's also a painter. Um, so, and, and abstract painters paint from different sources. Some paint from nature, some paint from uh, psychological inspiration, and others can paint from jazz music. And, and uh, Tom was one of the uh, abstract painters who used jazz music as his inspiration. Um, so we put this show together and we thought that uh, it was um, it would make an interesting visual continuity if you were planning to work the, the album cover. Uh, I've been a photographer since um, oh probably the 70s or mid 70s when I was in college and then I, I also studied calligraphy then and so Tom Hannon and I al always had an ongoing conversation about letter forms and typography and painting and um, he, it took me a long time to realize the importance of the work that he did in the 50s, but um, I think it, I'd like to see it get out and be enjoyed a little bit more. So, and I love the way he combined, um, in his graphic design, he used his paintings, he took photographs when necessary, he uh, came up with uh, idiosyncratic typography, uh, none of his covers are are repetition, repetitious, they're all, um, you know, of, of that moment and for that particular musician and that record. And Tom and Allison lived in the area where the jazz musicians were performing. They went to um, the nightclubs and, and uh, closed out Mingus at 2 a.m. and mm -hmm. at the Five Spot, you know. So they kind of, they lived a life as well as, as uh, and you were there when you were in Oh, yes, I was. <laughs> well, I sometimes helped him uh, doing mechanicals because, of course, it was right. pre-computer, and I had to do color separations and, and so on and so forth. So, And we, we had another man, a um, fellow artist named Bruce Barton, and he came and helped us. And at one point, we were putting out three covers a week for a period of time. I mean, he was just rolling them out. He, he would give the color separations to them, and he would 
do that. And then we'd call the messenger, and the messenger would come. We gave the messenger, messenger service a lot of business. And it went on. It was very successful. And all this took place in a loft on 22nd Street between 6th and 7th Avenue in New York. Years ago, uh, I wrote an article about an Eastern European tradition, which was to have little plaques on the wall. Orthodox Jews would face the East and pray three times a day, and these plaques would be on the Eastern wall and help that remind them where to face when they prayed. Um, the plaques then usually consisted either of the word Mizrach plus some illustrations uh, or the word Shaviti, uh, which uh, comes from a phrase in the Bible, I will always keep the, uh, the thought of the Lord before me. And, um, and it seemed clear to me, I have a daughter and son-in-law and two grandchildren who live in Jerusalem, that at this point what was crucial was, uh, was to get peace. Uh, and that uh, peace was crucial, and that part of what might bring peace was going to be everybody really wanting it and thinking about it. Uh, so I began a project of cutting 1,296 paper cuts that contained the word for peace in Hebrew. Uh, and this is part of that series. Um, I had exhibited some of them here last year. They were all black and white. This year, many of the ones I've exhibited include color, and I've also begun to assemble some of them in small grids, um, the four larger pieces that actually each have nine of the paper cuts. Uh, the other uh, part of the show this year comes from a... Sephardic tradition uh, and are what's called Hamzas, um, these um, paper cuts of the right hand uh, with an eye in the middle of the hand. It dates back to Phoenicia and actually was an amulet that was used um, to keep away the evil eye, to protect uh, a house or if people wear it, to protect the person from evil influences. Um, my son-in-law comes from Kurdistan, and, uh, and it's part of the folk tradition there. And so I got very interested in it and began creating them myself. Um, and did it using paper cuts, but also did some using uh, paper cuts of birch bark, um, and really enjoyed working with the natural material. Uh, the, uh, the Hamza actually is a tradition, it originally was a Muslim tradition called the Hand of Fatima, Fatima being the daughter of Muhammad, uh, but was adopted by Jews who lived in Arabic lands uh, who called it the Hand of Miriam, Miriam being Moses' sister who rescued him from, from the river, and, uh, and by Levantine Christians who called it the Hand of Mary. Uh, so it's a folk tradition that has really spread and unites, in a way, Muslims and Jews and Christians. Keep playing with paper cutting. I almost always have a scissors and paper in my pocket and cut whenever I'm standing in line or not doing something else. Uh, I'm also, ex there are two pieces there that are not for sale, the two that are red and black, and I'm doing more work trying to explore just those two colors and, um, and ways to layer black on red on black on red and then begin to get very complicated patterns. Um, and someday I want to have a show that's just red and black, but I'm still in the early stages of working on that. My son, who's coming to the exhibit with my grandchildren today, um, when he was two years old, had just gotten his first scissors, two and a half years old, and we went to visit my mother. He would take a bottle to sleep with him when he went to bed, not at other times, and we forgot his bottle. But he had just gotten a little pair of plastic scissors, and he wanted to take the scissors to bed. 
he happily went to bed without the bottle. And when we got back home, he no longer wanted the bottle. He would take his scissors to bed with a stack of scrap paper. And every morning, I would go in to get him up. And he would be in his bed, and there would be a giant pile of little scraps of cut paper next to the bed. He didn't care what he was cutting. He just liked the process. But I would pick up some of his scraps, and they would be beautiful. And I said, I want to learn how to do that. And so started cutting. This was um, 35 years ago. And, uh, and then got involved with a group called the Guild of American Paper Cutters that was just getting organized. And whenever I would travel, would try to find local paper cutters because it turns out it really is an international, uh, there's Mexican paper cutters who use chisels and do 50 pieces at once uh, with a lead block underneath the paper. There are Chinese paper cutters. Uh, there's a large tradition of Turkish paper cutting uh, as well as the, the sort of Swiss paper cutting. There's uh, a tradition of paper cutting in Poland and a, a wonderful paper cutter, Carolyn Guest, who lives up in St. Johnsbury, who learns to cut in Poland and cuts with a giant pair of seat shears. 